Hello and welcome everybody to our Jana LHSR webinar on the Shine tool for predicting primary care demand from large scale housing developments in Wales. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I help out with the LHSR community. And um, today we're pleased to be joined by colleagues from the strategy unit, uh, Justine Wiltshire, and uh, who's a project lead, and Uzay Mohammed, who's the developer for the Shiny based application. So just before I hand over uh, to our, our speakers today, we would just like you to know about some of the uh, uh, some of the exciting opportunities to get involved with the LHSR community. Uh, and um, you can see on the screen here, um, uh, we tend to provide through the LHSR Academy um, ongoing training courses. Uh, we've got our conference coming up. We also fund solutions, which is where we're trying, um, where, where analysts try and develop uh, 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 code based solutions to uh, common problems and headaches that we face in the, in the kind of data science um, uh, arena in health and care. Uh, you can join us many ways, by the way, but the place which is most active is the NSSR Slack community channel. So please do come and say hello there. It's very friendly and you can ask lots of questions and see lots of um, amazing uh, uh, people come and respond. Um, and we do have our new website now. So uh, you do have to become a member of the website to join future events, by the way. So all event management now is through that website. Uh, so just kind of bear that in mind, but you can also add your profile. Um, you can put up selfies and kind of tell us about yourself and so on. Um, uh, and um, I'll just close with this and then hand over to our speakers. So our next webinar is um, 17th of August. It's about an R package to calculate and visualize uh, primary care data. Uh, from the English uh, uh, NHS. Um, Kishore will be doing that webinar. And again, to book onto that webinar, please go onto the new onto the website and go to the events page. Click it and you can register. It's one click registration, providing you're a member of the website already. If you're not a member, you have to become you have to first become a member. And then after that, it's a one click registration process. Um, here are the courses for uh, for the for the month of August. We're trying to add in a few more, and again, further booking on all on new courses and so on will also be through the website. Uh, and in November, we've got uh, uh, we've got a conference. I'll open up the tickets will be opened up probably a month or so before, uh, so maybe kind of uh, late September. They go very fast, by the way. That's the reason I'm mentioning them to you now. Um, so so we will have uh, the tickets will be free for NHS and public sector. Um, so do keep an eye out on our Twitter announcements or our website announcements. Uh, but but uh, if you can hold those dates and it's a hybrid conference, so you can also attend virtually if you can't make it in person. So uh, so a, bit, a big thank you to the community as a whole, by the way, for all the amazing things that people do and volunteer to us. Um, so for now, uh, that's kind of me done. I'm going to hand over to um, uh, to Justine in a moment, but the, the webinar runs to, to about two o'clock. It's recorded and is available uh, later for uh, for viewing through the website or on YouTube page. Uh, questions and answers are so on host, so if you post your questions in the Q&A section, uh, I will either, if I think it's appropriate, I'll, I'll interrupt our speakers, uh, or if not, I'll, I'll kind of hold them to the end. Um, but please do, do, do try and uh, engage with, uh, with questions and, and comments uh, as we progress, really. So, um, Justine and Jose, thank you so much for coming, and I shall hand over to Justine, if I may know. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, so, uh, yeah, th thank you for that. So, my name is Justine Wiltshire, and I'm an analyst at the Strategy Unit. Um, in this session this afternoon, I'm just going to give you some background to, to the work that we've done. Then I will demo the tool, um, and after that, um, we'll share some of our reflections on our, our learning from this particular project. So in terms of background, uh, in Wales, there's uh, the NHS Wales Delivery Unit and they had some funding and that funding was geared uh, around working collaboratively uh, to develop solutions to common analytical problems. Um, the NHS Wales Delivery Unit uh, had also been contacted by a GP practice in Chepstow, which is in Monmouthshire. And this practice had said there are some really large housing developments happening nearby um, and they wanted to know how this would affect them. So rather than answering a question uh, just for one individual practice, um, it was felt this question was ideal to be extended by the funding uh, to cover lots of practices. And to this, the strategy unit, in this case, it's myself and my colleague is there, 
um, we worked in collaboration with the NHS Wales Liver Unit um, to help design a tool uh, to predict the effect on primary care from large scale housing developments in Wales. Um, and it's this tool that we're going to share with you today. So before I actually move to sharing the tool, um, I just want to mention two things about the general approach that we took. So firstly, um, the idea was that the tool should be fairly straightforward to use um, and that a user could run the tool uh, using the default settings and they could expect a reasonable and quite quick um, result from that. Um, there are opportunities to alter parameter sort of values in the tool with the aim of making the output a bit more sophisticated. Um, and as you'll see, the outputs can be downloaded. Uh, and the idea there was particularly around allowing a user to run a scenario, download the output uh, and to use those output to compare results. Secondly, um, I just wanted to touch on the logic that we use in the tool. So our approach was to take new properties uh, to convert those new properties into uh, the people who would uh, live there. Uh, and then for those new people to estimate their primary care activity at a particular practice. So it's properties, uh, then properties become people and people become their primary care activity. So I'm just going to take a second to share my screen. So this should be the, the tool that you can see now. So the tool is designed around practices um, and currently it would work for any practice in uh, in Monmouthshire, although all of the information, uh, the sort of reference information in the tool is actually for the whole of Wales. Uh, there's only one file that that's limited just to Monmouthshire. Um, so the first step is to tell the tool which practice you're interested in. So I'm going to enter a test practice here. Um, and when you do that, um, a list appears of all the housing developments uh, which are found to potentially affect that practice. Um, this list of housing developments um, is taken from Monmouthshire County Council's uh, housing trajectory, which is available on the council's website, and this shows all the new developments in the county over the next few years. It's important to note that these figures in terms of the new houses are cumulative, so they are the total uh, number of new properties built by the end of a particular year. Um, as you can see, this does give quite a long list with, with every development and every year. So to help the user, um, the most relevant developments are at the top of the list. Uh, and the most relevant is defined by looking for the practice of interest at what share of the practices registrants uh, are currently living in the same area as the development. Here today, I'm going to pick um, this particular development in 2025-26. Uh, and you can see there that there's 269 properties uh, being built by that year um, and uh, that 17 percent of the practices registrants already live in the same area as this development. You can if you want to pick multiple developments, but you do need to stay within the same year. So moving on to step two, um, we're looking at information here about the new properties and we use this information in calculating the number of new people with their age and gender breakdown. So in the background of the tool, we have occupancy rates for Wales by a range of different uh, dimensions. Uh, and in this step, we're effectively choosing the values of those dimensions, which in turn uh, defines the occupancy rates that we're applying. The um, development or developments, if we selected more than one, um, are shown here at the top uh, and there are grey cells which can't be changed, but there are white cells which are editable. Uh, the first editable cell is for deprivation. So it's not the case in this particular example, um, but it is for other housing developments in Monmouthshire where the developments are taking place on what were previously brownfield sites and those developments are also significantly large. Um, it was felt that that might actually alter the deprivation profile of an area. So uh, the tool sort of has that flexibility for the user to reflect that in the white cell here. Um, another factor which can influence occupancy rates uh, is whether or not housing is affordable. Uh, so the tool also has a parameter to the user can set to estimate the percentage of the development which will be affordable housing. Uh, we had quite a few conversations with uh, Monmouthshire County Council uh, and they actually have an affordable uh, target across their, their whole patch of 35%. So the tools that default value is set to 35. Um, today, uh, demonstration purposes, because there are some areas in Monmouthshire where actually that target is lower, uh, I'm just going to alter this to uh, 25%. 
other key factors um, which can influence occupancy rates, um, sorry, other key factors influencing the number and also the age and gender distribution of, of new people uh, will be those in the table at, uh, at the bottom here. Uh, and these are the type of property, so detached, semi-detached and terraced, and also the size of the property size being the number of bedrooms. In the housing trajectory from the council, unfortunately, there's no breakdown um, by those factors. There's just the total number of properties. Therefore, the tool provides an estimate uh, at that breakdown by type and size, and this is based on the profile of the existing housing stock in the area. In reality, uh, it's unlikely a new development would, would follow the profile of the existing housing stock. So these cells, um, they're, they're editable again, and they're ones that really uh, would be best to be populated with the, the sort of correct and real values. To find those, um, it would involve looking at developer site plans and working out how many uh, different, uh, how many numbers of different houses and different sizes there, there would be. Um, or also, if you can't find the developer site plans, to actually look back at the council plan commission data uh, and get the figures from there. Now, in terms of this demonstration, um, I'm just going to leave these cells as they are and move on to step three. Oh, sorry, I've actually forgotten there's an extra step. So it's not just uh, general homes uh, that, that can be built, it's also care homes. Um, so th this is it's effectively a different sort of property area. Unfortunately, there's no housing trajectory uh, from the council for care homes as there was with general housing. Uh, so what the tool allows you to do is to enter uh, information about a care home. So it will need a location uh, and also a size in terms of the number of bedrooms, uh, and you can add that into the tool. If you wanted to, you, you can add uh, multiple care homes as well. Uh, so now we can move on to step three, uh, and it shows the number of new people uh, in the new properties, uh, and also on the chart there, the breakdown by their age and gender. So now we have the new people, um, we can move on to their use of primary care uh, at the practice of interest. To do this, a um, decision was made uh, to apply age and gender primary care utilisation rates to the new people uh, and that those rates would be the specific ones for the practice of interest. So to do this, um, we worked with a test practice in the area uh, on getting a download of uh, the, the, their historical activity over a 12 month period. So you can upload the uh, historical activity from the practice. And uh, when the upload finishes, um, you'll see a chart appears on the right uh, showing activity by week and also some metadata about the file. Uh, and it's, it, it really it's just to provide some reassurance for the user that the file has uploaded as intended. And then in the background, uh, the tool applies the utilisation rates calculated from this historical activity and practice this size uh, to give the expected primary care appointments uh, that the new people will require. Um, these will be shown on step 4b, so we've got the total number there um, and also on the chart by uh, the different age groups. In this step, we also have um, another editable cell uh, here. So um, this cell is centred around the fact that not everyone in an area will register with the same practice. Uh, in this example, historically, 54% of people resident in this LSOA uh, were registered with the practice of interest. Uh, but perhaps, uh, depending on exactly where the development is located, that, that percentage might alter. So the cell here gives you a chance to, to reflect that. Uh, in today's demonstration, I'm going to assume that the new development is, is really close to the practice uh, and that share is going to actually increase to 80%. And when you do that, um, the figures and the chart both update. So the uh, final step, step five, uh, brings together the various um, inputs and outputs from the tool. Um, so it shows you the developments that you've selected and the parameter values that you've selected. It summarises uh, the sort of uh, the property information and also the people information. And then it starts to look at primary care activity. So it shows the total increase and what that would be as a, as a sort of percentage share based on the historical activity. And we have this by month and we have it by age group uh, again, and then we have it by the different visit types. And then we have it by a branch site if there is one, uh, and then we also have it by profession. So the report you can download using the button here and you can save that uh, and then you could run it with different uh, sort of parameter values or different scenarios and just compare those download reports to compare results. 
Uh, one final thing I want to mention um, is that the the tool is very flexible. So if you went back and said, actually, I want to try this, you know, with a different value, you don't have to restart it or, or rerun everything. You can just go through to any particular step where you want to change a value. Uh, and when you came back to step five, the report would automatically update. So that's the end of the tool demo. Um, it's relatively quick, um, but I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague there, who's actually been the person. Right? Yes, yeah, sorry. Just, just before we hand back, so that's been a really good overview, I think. I'm just wondering whether you you might just kind of um, just take us through the outputs just a little bit more um, systematically, just so we have a, an, as a. I think people are really interested from the comments that, that lots of people are are interested, and in some people actually worked on primary care demand from housing as well. So why don't you just take us through a sample of the outputs? Because I think the input configuration seems quite straightforward, but just talk us through some of the kind of headlines and the tables and the graphs that are coming through, please. OK, cool. Thank so a, a lot of this was developed kind of because uh, it was a, a very collaborative piece of work, kind of exactly what uh, the, they wanted to see on the report. But the idea is that if you printed it off, you'd know which version of the report you were looking at because you'd have your uh, developments and your parameters listed here. Um, and then here we've got uh, all properties summarised. So in the in the demo we've done today, it's just one development that we've picked. But if we pick multiple developments, this would still just be the one table. So it's a summary of, of, of all the housing information in terms of the numbers of different types of houses and different sizes. Then the people, we'd seen those figures on the chart, but we just thought it was useful to have um, the actual numbers there uh, if people wanted to use those. Uh, but the main bit of the report is the effect on primary care. And the effect on primary care, you might want to view it in different ways rather than just leaving it at the one number and the, sort of the scale of the increase. We wanted to be able to show it by some different factors. All these factors, so in this example, it's month, um, they're all in the historical data set that we uploaded. So if for some reason one of these factors wasn't available, then this bit of the each individual chart wouldn't work. So if we didn't have a time period at, at sort of activity date on the um, on the data, then this wouldn't be possible. So just to kind of flag up that it's kind of what you put in is, is what you get out. Um, but this shows the monthly profile um, of activity. And we've got the sort of the current or really it's the historical activity, but it's what the, the practice might expect currently. And then they've got sort of the extra slice of the new activity, which is the additional impact of the housing development. Um, age group, I think we've actually seen the chart, that chart on an earlier step, but we just wanted to kind of put it in again on this final output so that this is the version that you could sort of save and download. Uh, and then by the different visit types. So the thinking with visit types is um, particularly in primary care, it's going to be a different resource implication for GPs, whether or not they have to um, see people in surgeries, make home visits um, or actually have telephone consultations uh, with patients. And so we just wanted to have that sort of split there for that, that kind of help with that decision making. Then um, the branch sites, not, not I think generally practices don't often have branch sites, but a fair few do. So we're just splitting it by the different uh, the different sites there for this test practice. Um, and then by profession, um, obviously out of primary care, it's not just GPs, you will get you know, nurses, uh, pharmacists, uh, um, some very small amounts of activity uh, for these train, uh, associate practitioners and sessional GPs. Um, so really it's about the information that you put in to the, in the historical activity. What's in there is, is what the tool will be able to, to sort of split this information by. Um, then we've got, some... we've, got, we've got a question which I think might be uh, relevant. I, I, you can pick it up later if you want, but or yeah, maybe it's like, um, how easy was it? Um, or what, just tell us about the process by which you scrape the, the plan developments from the council website. OK, cool. So my understanding is, um, I mean, I, I learned a lot about council and planning data on this on this project. Um, but I, my understanding is that all councils have to publish their housing trajectories and that says for, uh, I think they're published every few years, but for sort of, uh, five, six years in the future, how many new homes do they plan to build? So I think that information is freely available and it will have the site name and it has the number of houses in each year. Um, so that, that information is freely available but uh, there's no detail from that. So it wasn't really so much scraping, it was actually just, just it's just one Excel spreadsheet in the case of Monmouthshire. And I think that would be similar for other councils. Um, 
but the difficulty is getting the detailed information. So we've made that assumption around the sort of profile of the housing stock, but you need to get that right really to, to get the best results from the tool. So you would need the correct you know, number of two bedroom detached houses. You need the correct number of three bedroom detached houses rather than just having uh, this, this, this sort of average profile applied. Does that answer the question enough, do you think? I think so, thank you. No, can I also ask, and this might be one for us there, but um, where is the actual app, uh, the Shiny app hosted? Okay, so at the moment it's held by the NHS Wales delivery unit. Um, I think there were some plans to make it um, a bit more freely available, obviously, given the way it's been written, um, you know, it could be it, it sort of available um, easily for people to access. Um, but obviously, the, kind of they're they're the owners of the tool, so we probably need to discuss that uh, with them a little bit more. Currently, um, our work on the tools finished, but there, I think there are some changes that they also want to make. The text—I don't know if anybody noticed. Uh, there's lots of typos in the text, but it's because uh, that's going to be um, refined. The, the delivery unit wants to do a little bit of work on um, exactly what the text says mainly because they want it to almost be tested with users in, in practice they've got a couple of sample practices so uh, it's still not quite finished because we've got these little bits to do with it and then hopefully it would be freely available after that but that that's something we would have to confirm later that's great thank you justine do, do carry on by the way uh, and if there are uh, points at which we might be discussing a little bit of the feedback from uh, decision makers or gps or other stakeholders and that would be great, but but carry on with the flow that you you, you were planning. That's great, thank you. Well, I kind of, I mean, the tool isn't um, it's quite simple really, so it doesn't take very long to demo. I think the concepts are fairly similar. It's great to get those questions. There were some great questions there that that Mohammed reflected back. So thank you to to everyone who's, who's raised a question. Um, so yeah, it's kind of still draft at the moment, although it's it's there or thereabouts. Um, but I think I'm going to pass you over to my colleague uh, Zare now. And he's actually been the person who's written the tool in Shiny. Uh, I personally wouldn't have had a clue. I think I need to go on the, the Shiny course that was on uh, Mohammed's slide uh, at the beginning. Um, but Azair was also new to Shiny at the beginning of this project. Um, and we felt that what we wanted to do today was not just demo the tool, but to um, share our reflections on that very technical learning. So I, I will hand over to um, Azair in a second. I'll just stop sharing my slide um, and then Azair can take you through his experiences. Thank you, Justine. Um, yeah, so this was my my first sort of experience using Shiny. Um, I've had maybe four or five years worth of our experience beforehand, but this is definitely a, a different um, a different kind of task. I think, as with most R related, um, I guess packages, it took some intense sort of period of time of learning to, um, to to really kind of get to grips and get things moving the way I wanted, wanted them to be. Uh, but the usual methods of self-learning, uh, you know, tutorials, art articles, forums, they were all uh, things that, uh, that I found to be very useful. Uh, and then I think uh, in parallel with the learning process, there's also um, an application like this where there's lots of different um, different tabs, different graphics that all depend on each other and it's very interlaced in terms of the, the user interface. Um, in terms of coding that, it takes a lot of time to, a lot of focus time to plan out how your script should look. Um, you, I think the thing I found the most useful was to sit down and plan out every single interaction in my script. Uh, what button should do what, what value should carry through to what, um, so that when that whole kind of map was laid out in front of me, the actual filling in of the code um, became a, a much simpler task. And I think uh, if I hadn't gone that route, it would have become an application that becomes less and less robust the more changes you make to it. Um, but I think uh, we've just got some some questions. Some of them mm -hmm. may be relevant now, some may a bit later, but. Um... Can I, can I just check that? Are you are you sharing any particular screen at the moment? I'm not you, sharing a screen. Yeah, you know that's fine. Sorry, I just need to clarify. Um, uh, somebody's asked if it might be possible, uh, in the future at least, to share the code, which was used to generate the tool. So obviously not the not the data because that's uh, that may be quite um, 
that, that would be subject to 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 go, uh, data governance issues. But um, uh, any, any thoughts on that from you and Justine? I might chip in on that one. Um, so currently the code is on GitHub, which is uh, it's in a private repository at the moment. It's just the way we've we've worked with uh, the delivery unit. Certainly, uh, kind of there's a general approach, isn't there, of, of sharing code and everything being very transparent. We'd we'd, we'd love to do that. So perhaps we should uh, just make sure we publicise that and put it on a on GitHub in a in a public area. Um, I'm guessing that would be a good way to to share code like this. Thank you, Justine. Yes, I think I think when you're ready. If it, if it was uh, put up on GitHub, then perhaps on the NSSR community, we would we would uh, invite a, sh uh, a short blog about it and then promote it and kind of that kind of thing. I think people would, would so would value that. Uh, and a related question, I think if, if it eventually is shared on, on uh, a public repository of GitHub, is the extent to which the tool is modular so that people can add stuff to it. And that's one of the things about the open source community is people start off with somebody's um, first attempt at something which is usually very valuable uh, but then they kind of add to it so is there a sense that that's also part of the philosophy in some way um, i think that definitely is from us and from the delivery unit you know very much kind of it, it, it's for everybody's benefit isn't it i'm sure there'll be things that we would have you know looking back we maybe do differently or if we were to do it again we'd do differently and i think it's fascinating and a real positive to see how other people might take things any work but particularly this piece of work forward in future we'd, we'd really like to that to happen we would like, really like to hear from people about that uh, th there's one uh, uh, the methodological question i'm not sure if it's you or zero best place to address this but um is the new activity calculated by adding in some sort of percentage uplift or can you just give a little bit more about the kind of underlying mathematics of, of how the um, the variables are uh, are used to uh, project demand. OK, so the, the current activity or as it is, the, is the historical download that that is just the, the numbers that, that have happened in the past. So that's that's very fixed depending on the time period you pick. Um, probably a word word of caution. Obviously, during COVID, we saw a massive drop in in GP activity. So you wouldn't want to include uh, lots of the COVID uh, pandemic in, in your historical data. You might get some some sort of unintended consequences from that. But in terms of predicting the demand, as I said, we have properties and we turn those properties into people and that will have th their age and their gender. Um, and so we know how many, uh, I don't know, 48 year old females we're going to have living in the new houses. And then we know from the practice how often uh, women at that age would use their uh, go to the GP. So that's how, how we, it's quite simple maths really. We create the, the estimate of the people and then we apply their utilisation of primary care. So it's actually uh, mapping on historic demand, not necessarily. Yes. Uh, and presumably, if the historic demand was uh, was over over a, a series of um, months or years, then if if that was trending up, then that would that trend be built into the calculation as well? I think. Okay, so I think. It isn't built in currently. It's an interesting point, is it? It goes back to that. How would people develop the tool um, moving forward? One of the reasons was getting information from practice systems that that can be a bit tricky. So we just wanted to go with one 12 month period and be quite simple. Uh, uh, you know, the approach was quite simple deliberately. Um, I guess if you had different, you know, if you could get two different time periods, you could run the with up different uploaded data and then you could compare those results. And so actually, you know, I know that we had X amount of appointments in one historic period and actually in the most recent year we've had an increase and it's this so maybe you want to kind of you, you know alter that in, in the in the tool it doesn't work like that currently it could be made to um probably a bit clunky or it could be just a future development and you could look at trends in activity and you could decide to apply that trend as well so that sounds great actually but that sounds like a really nice platform to build on but also um you know in year forecasts or, or 12 months forecasts are still very valuable in their own right, really. Um, um, can I just, uh, perhaps a question for was there, and do feel free to carry on as there in terms of things you wanted to say, but um, I'm anticipating we'll have people on the call who are, some would be very new to R uh, and uh, probably know, or very new to Shiny as well. So do you have two or three tips for them on how they might get, uh, get, get going really with, um, with doing shiny apps. 
Um, hmm. Okay, so I think um, in my in my process um, quite early on, uh, I think I, w I went to a shiny related um, uh, introductory course. I think maybe it was Chris Beely's. Um, so I think for people that prefer that method of learning, I think if you can if you can find an introductory course to get you started that can be very valuable uh, it's very useful to have someone guide you through the initial things that that will be very new to you um i think there's also uh a i, th I think it's a free shiny related ebook um that would probably be very very detailed if that is if that is um the, the type of learning you prefer um in terms of going about starting to develop something in shiny um i think um so it's almost in two parts there's a part of the code that's used to create the user interface and there's a part of the code that's used to create what or, or to sort of build a, the the application in the background and like sort of like the, the calculations and all that stuff um so i think uh getting to grips with how to build the, the interface is a useful thing um, and if you have a background in html that's also very useful um, it gives you a lot more control over visual aspects and probably just trying to start as simple as possible um, as simple as like a drop down box and a graphic uh, and getting that to work and then building complexity from there because uh, i think these scripts can get very very big especially with lots of um, interface uh, objects um but if you start off nice and simple and build off of what you understand um i think that's the, the best approach really thank you uh, so do you have any other things to uh, to highlight um no i, th I think that's the, the summary of my main learning experiences in this piece of work yeah how many lines of code is it in the end behind the dashboard it's about one and a half thousand lines of code um there would there could there could have been other methods for for writing the script and where you separate out code into different scripts um but in this case it's it's just one very big script with uh, different sections for the different um different different tabs of the um the, the dashboard yeah um justine can i just perhaps turn to you and ask um have you had the opportunity to uh, Engage any feedback from uh, colleagues in uh, the NSS Lawyers Delivery Unit, or you know, GPs, or other stakeholders. Yes, yeah, so there was one practice we've had with this sort of, the sort of test practice that asked the original question, um, and sort of the audience there really was the practice managers, um, and I think what they liked was it was quite simple. They didn't have to worry too much about changing the deprivation or the the affordable housing you know you could run it as it stands and they, they got a sense of the figures and they you know it was it was i think they found it quite non-threatening uh, and it was it was designed to be that way you know that the sort of users uh, kind of that sort of audience um although analysts obviously other people can use it as well so that that feedback was that the users quite liked it um i think that's a really important point and sometimes i think people very uh, uh, who can do very sophisticated analysis uh, uh, kind of try and optimize the analysis but um one of the one of the kind of balancing forces to that is the extent to which end users feel they can understand this and use it and um and so the uh, uh, um uh, often to make a uh, the aim is to often just to try and make a better decision compared to the previous methodology and in order to do that, we don't have to have um, kind of cutting edge methodology to do that. We just need it to be better than the old method. But the old method sits in a place which is often um, intuitive, uh, easy to use and kind of part of the, the way of working in that organisation. So the new method has to meet them at that point, I think and carry the decision maker uh, from that point onwards. And so, so I think simplicity is a key design principle actually. Uh, and um, um, so, so, so um, 
Yeah, so please do carry on, but I'm just kind of uh, uh, reinforcing your point, really. Uh, any other any other kinds of feedback or insights? Yeah, so I think uh, interestingly, the other feedbacks being sort of almost not really on the tool itself, but what else might be uh, useful. So um, I know the delivery unit had a, a chat with the Welsh Government, and I think what they, they started thinking about was actually, does this kind of analysis allow them to know where to build new primary care centres? So in fact, because it, it's kind of looking at, you know, building residential or care home properties. Um, but then if you were going to build a new, a new GP practice, where would you then put it based on this, you know, the future uh, sort of where people would be living and the volumes of people in each area? So that, that was quite an interesting question. There's no way that the tool is designed to answer that. But almost by answering one question, it's a sort of domino effect. Is actually this would be really useful to know this is this is a piece of work perhaps not a tool, but a, a piece of work that, that could be done, sort of showing what's possible. Um, the other the other thing is um, the tool at the moment, it's it very much designed to just say how many more appointments are you going to have in primary care? But a 7.6% increase we saw in the demo there was, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen really to this one practice. That that seems to be, a, given the current state of the NHS and, and the demand on primary care, that seems to be a big increase. So I think that there's almost uh, a wider question around what about the indirect demand on GPs and not just seeing the patient, but, you know, the, the other time that they would spend, you know, writing up notes or, or doing things like that. Um, and also, when you get a large increase like this, what about the space? Will they need to recruit? Do they need extra rooms for their extra GPs to work in? I think there's a, there's a much bigger question uh, around demand on primary care uh, that, that the tool isn't answering. Uh, so just to be clear, it isn't answering that, but it would be great if, if it could also make some uh, you know assumptions and, and, and kind of help answer those kind of questions. We've got a couple more questions, but I'm, I'm going to perhaps just come back to the point you've made now, really. Uh, there is a there is a kind of um, uh, a graveyard of tools uh, that, that that have been developed and not used, and I think it's really encouraging that that uh, an approach was adopted, which which has led to uh, um, stakeholders, decision makers actually asking for more tools. That that's actually a very positive positive sign. So 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 well done for 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 kind of being in in that collaboration. We've had. So there's a question about where the Shiny app is hosted. Can I just check I've got the answer correct? It's hosted by NHS Wales at the moment. Yes, so, so it's, it's held securely by them. I think the plan was to make it available because the idea is practice staff are the audience um, as, as well as others, but it's, it's kind of around people who work in primary care. So at the moment it's not freely available, but we hope that it will be. I'm certainly I can uh, bring that up with the delivery unit and just see wh where they are with their plans. I think there were technical issues around servers as well and, and where to put, uh, where to actually physically put the tool. But, but, uh, but uh, Jenny Morgan, who's who's very senior in that network, I think she's she's also very keen on open source and, yeah. shares and so on. So it it probably just be a matter of logistics really rather than an in principle issue. Yeah. Um, and the second question, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I don't understand this, but it says, what was your CI or CD process? So does anybody on the, uh, I, I don't know what CRCD means, but is it, uh, uh, is that conflict of interest? No, I don't, I don't know, sorry. Uh, it's, I, I don't think you do either, because you'd, you'd have jumped in if there was, yeah, that's fine, okay. Well, look, if Brian, if you want to rephrase your question, that would be helpful, uh, I'll give it another go. Um, uh, and in the meantime, um, I don't know what the, uh, what the literature says about, uh, housing housing uh, developments and uh, primary care demand, but it's, it's a very important question. Um, and I suspect that the work you've done might actually be a useful contribution to the literature as well. So so hopefully there's a opportunity to try and publish this work. Um, and I think there are parallels with the new hospital programme yeah. uh, uh, and, and you know how we think about building new hospitals. So there's kind of a, an interesting time really because new hospitals don't get built every day. Uh, and so um, sharing across those two different aspects of healthcare uh, and planning, I think would be would also be, and I know the strategy units doing lots of work on the, on the new hospital programme as well. OK, um, I'll just see if there's any more questions or comments on the call. Um, and uh, in the chat, you can see there is uh, a feedback. Please do 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 complete the feedback for us. That's a, always a key part of keeping us on track and making sure we're kind of doing things which are which are which are valuable. Uh, 
So uh, just I'll just turn to uh, uh, Rachel. Uh, sorry, to um, to it was there. Just was there. Do you have any uh, any other final comment before I hand back to Justine, and then I'll take the mic. Um, no, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining, especially on your uh, on your annual leave. That's very very good of you. Um, uh, and Justine, any other comments or thoughts, please, for me? Um, I think. Um, I don't really have any more final comments and final thoughts, really. I think we've covered everything. Um, I'd probably just finish by saying if people had questions or even if you want to say, well, it's not very good in this area, but we could, you know, it could be changed and it could work better. Um, be really happy, you know, to have those conversations. It, 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 everything can be improved on. Um, so, yeah, if anyone's in questions uh, and want to get in touch, please feel free. Thank you. Um, so a uh, big thank you to our presenters for giving time and sharing their work with us and also all the colleagues who've joined the call today and the kind of comments and questions that they've shared with us. Um, I would encourage everybody on the call to uh, the community is, is our community, it's your community. So whatever you, uh, if you have any thoughts about presenting some work or you know someone who's done some interesting work and you think would be valuable to share. So please uh, uh, kind of encourage them to, to, to come forward. And also join us on our Slack channel, please. Um, it's a very friendly place to ask uh, all sorts of questions. You get, in fact, Chris Bean is very active on there and he responds to questions um, uh, very, very quickly. Um, so, so um, and we are also, and, and you can see from the web, from the uh, screenshot at the moment, the next webinar will be in August. So please do join us for that one. And uh, we've also got the NSS Lab Community Conference coming up. Um, the intro courses in August are already booked, I'm afraid. Uh, so that's why I'm not plugging them that much. But we are trying to I think the one in September is also booked, but we're trying to hold a new one, an extra one in September. So um, just to just, to, you know, all our events will go onto the website and registration will be through there. So please bear that in mind. Um, and we look forward to kind of uh, uh, having you join us uh, in, in as many um, uh, uh, touch points as possible really. If you want to consider submitting an abstract also for the conference then we're still open for abstracts. Um, if you're not sure just drop us an email with your idea we'll, we'll be very happy to kind of support and help. Um, for some people these things are definitely new experiences and uh, and a friendly, uh, a friendly uh, hand is always welcome I think. So okay lovely thank you everybody for your time and your uh, your attendance today. Uh, uh, we're finishing a little bit early. Um, um, uh, oh, I do have that question, Brian. So let me just uh, publish Brian's last question. See if you've got a. Uh, Brian's explained. Um, uh, so, so th the question was around constant integration and constant uh, deployment. So, how do you test any additional code against the already set code? And also, how do you test that the numbers received were correct? Um, so let's take the second one first. I'm presuming you're looking at the historical data there, uh, Justine. Do you know how they thought about um, kind of validating that data? Yeah, so um, I don't think it was validated in terms of uh, comparing against another source of information, but it was validated in terms of, um, so the practice of interest was uh, a practice that used EMIS, and the strategy unit is hosted by Midlands and Lancashire CSU and we have a primary care sort of data quality team and they do a lot of sort of um, writing calls, uh, writing queries to extract data from EMIS. So they helped, um, they helped also and they helped the practice to, to download the data and given the amount of knowledge and experience they have, uh, you know, we, we would assume that, that that extract routine ran, well we know it ran because we have the data but assume that, that that is the correct basis to pull the data. Um, we also had some support, uh, one of our staff at the strategy unit got experience with primary care data so she also came and provided some sort of, a, sort of reassurance and advice and guidance and she was involved in that extract process. So there were many eyes and a standard process was applied uh, to EMIS to, to extract the data. So that's the second question is it hopefully I've answered that okay for you. Um, in terms of the first question, how did we test any additional code against the already set code? Um, well, because we were writing the, um, I may not be interpreting this question correctly, but um, as we wrote the project and the, and the project brief changed a little bit, and you, you, as it always does with analytics, you're kind of refining it and improving it and, and adding things in. So we just had basically a sort of testing process across the whole process. So at each step we've, we've tested that the, we're getting the values that we expect by doing the calculations manually and then testing that for each step. 
Um, and then we've gone back and we've said, OK, if we change this now, does this alter the value? Just those kind of sense checks on the tool, really. So it's more of a standard approach to writing code and does it give you the right answer? So hopefully um, I've answered that question correctly. Thank you, Justin. That's great. And thank you, Brian, for your clarification as well. So, um, OK, so all, all that's left now is really to thank our speakers, thank our, our colleagues who have engaged with it, uh, joined the call, and thank Charlotte especially for helping to organise it. Um, I bid you all say well, a, a good afternoon to everybody, and hopefully we'll, we'll catch you at the next opportunity uh, in August. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care.